Having discussed how a FinFET is fabricated, now we're going to move over to how it actually affects us in the layout. So actually, the really bad thing about this is that layout complexity keeps on rising and rising and rising. As you can see in this, uh, this slide by Qualcomm, the uh, effort, the relative effort to layout um, in, in designs has gone up uh, like 2x since between 28 nanometers and 7 nanometers. And the interesting thing about that is that LVS actually has become less of a problem, or at least it remains constant. What is really hard is the DRC closure, because we have all these tons and tons of DRCs, which are really hard to understand, and sometimes you don't even see them until you rise to a higher um, level hierarchy. But this is something that we'll have to be discussing uh, throughout, and we have to deal with it. There's not much you can do. But layout really becomes something that uh, is really hard to deal with um, in these in these really uh, dense technologies. So um, just to, to, to start looking at this, I want to show you a, a planar transistor versus a FinFET trans transistor. So traditional planar transistors, they look something like this. We had our poly over diffusion. So these are our poly layers and these are our, you know these blue things over here there are diffusions and the poly over diffusion you know creates the transistor over here um, and then we add our contacts usually our contacts would actually be you know more like a square um, rather than this type of a, of a structure over here okay with a finfet we look at it differently we start with our fins which are these guys over here and we have um, our polys which are um, perpendicular to them and running over them. So um, that's how our finfets are going to be uh, are going to be built. And again, the you know the uh, channels are going to be these parts under here. okay? Um, the contacts are uh, going to be um, in between them, riding over the fins and actually shorting between the different fins and creating one single transistor. Okay, so that's just a, a first picture of it. Now this gets very confusing. Um, you have to watch it or go through it many times and, and look at it again and again because it's very different than what we may have gotten used to from planar type of layout. So let's uh, take a FinFET stack and look at it at both a cross-section and a three-dimensional kind of uh, perception. And I'm taking something like a 5 nanometer stack. It's different when you go at 7 nanometers, 16 nanometers. Things get more and more complicated, but um, let's try to look at how it kind of is. And this is just very like a uh, um, an overview of the type of thing. So we start with our fins. And remember, our fins are these three-dimensional type of things that are going, in this case, from left to right. And if we take just a cross-section of it, it's this one piece of this green stuff. Okay, then we take our polygate. Our polygate is sitting on top of it. So we get these three sides. You know, uh, uh, it's a trigate, right? We get three sides of our polygate over the fin, causing our capacitances on three sides. And when we look at it, again, from the cross-section, we have this red layer that we see over here. Again, the transistor, the uh, source and drain are on the two sides, and the uh, current is running between them. What we do then is we mark our OD layer. Our OD layer is actually saying where we are going to build that epi. So we take a, you know, this type of a, this blue type of a thing. We say this whole area, that's going to be a transistor with three fins on it. So we can build our epi and we can actually short between these types of th things. We don't care about them uh, being shorted together because they're going to be the same type of transistor. So this is how we mark our OD on the top of the whole uh, 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 um, transistor uh, uh, definition. What we then do is we take our epi and we lay down a first metal layer, which is called MD, which is the contact to our epis, to our source and our drain. And this is not anymore like a type of a square thing. In fact, it's kind of even better if it's a larger block. So we have this lower, lower, lower layer, which is this MD that sits on top of our epis and it connects. Actually, that's the, that's the contact to our, um, to our source and our drain. Um, the gate, again, with this uh, coag, with this contact over gate um, uh, area. Uh, uh, so we have the, v, it's VG, that's a special via that's sitting on top of the gate over here. And, uh, um, okay, remember that what we had to do is we had to cap the gate before, and then we had to cap the MD over here. So in case we had misalignment, uh, this gate contact wouldn't accidentally short to the MD. So this is capped now. And because it's capped, we have to put another via on top of this to break that cap and to connect to uh, the metal layer. So um, in, on the, on the uh, source and drain areas, we actually have two kind of contact layers, this MD and this VD. So we have the first one, which is the real contact to the source and the drain. And then we have the via that breaks the, um, the, the cap 
it allows us to have this contact over a gate um, type of thing and allows us to get to the, the first metal layer. So on top of that, we put the first metal layer, and often this metal layer will be called metal zero. So that is both contacting the, the VD um, uh, the, that we have here on the source of the drain and the VG. So the VD and the VG are these lower level vias, these um, you know under the, the lowest via, and they bring us up to this metal zero layer. And the metal zero layer, as you see, it's a, what unidirectional, it can't be broken, it can't have any jogs. Then we have what we call via zero, and via zero then goes up to via one. And again, probably via one is also one of these types of layers that cannot be broken at all. It's only unidirectional. Maybe higher than that, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, less constraints. So we saw how the stack is. Now let's discuss fin, uh, layout itself. And for layout, we have these two types of uh, multi uh, multi-transistor inverters that are going to be um, connected to each other uh, in parallel and uh, are driving it output. So we start with our constant fin grid. So in FinFET, we always have this constant fin grid. The whole wafer basically is covered with these fins that we can't play with their sizes. We can't play with the distances between them. They're made, again, with the uh, tightest pitch and the most advanced type of a, um, of a lithography that we can, uh, that we can use. And the perpendicular area, we're going to put our gates. Now, the gates are also a very tight pitch, um, and usually they're going to be made with a minimum uh, L. However, you can make larger Ls, not in uh, the same areas, because I showed you before, you need all kinds of block masks and so forth to make this. So what it's going to do is you're going to have big DRCs, you're going to have to move them away, and also um, we'll kind of discuss it later in layout dependent effects. The, the best modeling is done for the minimum Ls. Anything that's not minimum is not modeled as well. It's going to uh, not, not be as perfect as the rest. So really, you should probably use minimum Ls anyway. Um, for digital design, that's probably a given. For analog design, it's actually better to connect several fingers instead of taking a longer L. We're, we're then going to define our OD layers. Uh, I probably didn't draw it correctly here. Usually you're going to define your OD layer as a full uh, kind of a square over here. But again, the OD layers are going to show where we're going to actually have um, uh, transistors defined versus maybe over here we're not going to have any transistors at all. Okay, then we're going to have our, um, our N well and our P, you know, our N well and our P well, our N active and P active. Those are these little lines that I added over here. Okay, and now we're going to have these um, these cut layers, these uh, in the orthogonal direction. So I, I mentioned before that layers such as the poly and the OD and the fin, if we want to get rid of them, what we'll do is we'll use in with our regular critical dimension, we're going to make another mask, which is a, a cut mask. So we want to stop having the poly here. The poly was created as a one long line. To stop it, we're going to make a cut mask, which now is going to make a perfect, you know, stop over here. And the same thing with our OD. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to create our source, our, our source and our drain uh, on the whole area here and then cut it off in the areas where we don't want it. We're going to like obliterate it. So these are these cut layers that we're going to see in, in uh, a lot of the lower layers. Um, next, we make our MD, and remember, the MD is the contact layer, but the MD is not a square like in, uh, in previous types of planar technologies. It's a rectangle, and it shorts between the uh, different ODs. So, uh, first of all, the ODs may have been kind of shorted together or close together because, remember, they have that diamond shape, um, and the pitch is very tight here. We didn't care because we wanted them to be connected together, and we used this OD cut to obliterate the ones we didn't want. But the MD ensures that they're really connected together, so we have have this one like a uh, uh, trans single uh, single monolithic type of transistor that in this case has four polys on it uh, four fins on it then we have our VG which is a coag so we have our VG sitting on top of our gate and we have our VDs which is the second type of a contact uh, layer that enables us to go up from MD up to uh, the metal zero and then we have our metal zero that's going to go over the rest of them and provide our rails. Now pay attention here that we didn't even need to go up to metal one inside our standard cell. So our standard cell, really a lot of the standard cells are built only with metal zero. They don't even need to go up to metal one. So um, I hope that uh, showed you a bit of the layout um, that you'll run into in FitFet. It's very different than layout in planar technologies and it's very confusing, but I hope that gave you kind of an explanation of how this type of stuff is done. An important point is diffusion breaks, which is something that, that, that really came in with these FinFET things. Okay, so um, 
Uh, diffusion break is required between two active areas. What it does is it does two uh, main things. It blocks the epitaxial growth. So again, what we have here is we have our, um, our uh, source and our drain that are being built on these green areas, right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, over here, and they build this, you know, epi, and we need to block the epitaxial growth so it won't go into the next um, transistor that, that's supposed to be uh, disconnected from it. So uh, we need to uh, make uh, something that blocks it off. And the other thing is we need to provide some sort of a back wall for the stressors. So uh, the stressors, remember, they, they're pulling and pushing and they need to have something to pull and push against or else they're, they're, they're not going to be able to be as effective. So we um, make some sort of a STI over here and we stick a dummy gate inside that really um, uh, provides this type of uh, both a uh, back wall and a uh, blocking of the epitaxial growth. And the basic way to do it when you start with a new process is to have a double diffusion break. So we have one of these dummy polys over here, then nothing in the middle, and another dummy poly over here. This one is used for the right transistor. This one's used for the left transistor. The problem with that is it uh, wastes a lot of area. And so as the processes get more mature, um, the fabs find out ways to actually en enable us to have a single diffusion break. And there are ways to do it. It makes uh, the process, again, much harder. It hurts yield and so forth. But it saves so much area that it's commonly done. So now uh, most of the standard cell libraries will have this single diffusion break, which will allow us to, uh, to, to save the area that was just wasted over here. Um, but it, again, this is something that often doesn't appear when we get our early uh, versions of our, uh, of our process. And um, also it may uh, cause yield problems. So some, um, some companies may want to uh, use the double diffusion break to, for, to improve their yield. Density in floor plant considerations. So uh, another thing about these fin-fed processes, that critical process steps are extremely sensitive to what we call um, loading. So the pattern density really affects it. So in, in previous, you know, um, uh, planar technologies, we always had to pay attention to density. There was this kind of uh, rule of thumb that we needed 30 to 70 percent of a layer to be covered by uh, a metal. But now it's really, really problematic with these all these uh, process steps and and things pattern, you know, the, the process loading is really a problem. And th therefore, we have thousands of DRCs that are really hard to pass and they're um, foreign. We don't understand them. They're very restrictive and we don't understand them. And they're done for all kinds of reasons to both ensure that, you know, we get um, less variation, but also to reduce um, layout dependent effects that we'll be discussing later. So uh, the DRCs, they reduce unmodeled long-range systematic and random variation. So there are all these um, kind of things that happen because we have um, um, uh, all kinds of the effects that depend on the density of different sort of things. They affect stress and they affect all kinds of gradients and so forth. And so one of the ways that the, the uh, fabs um, help us remove that because they, they're hard to model is they just put in these um, constraints on their DRCs of how we have to, to add densi uh, density fill and so forth. Um, and, uh, and it really, um, it, it makes it really hard to figure out how to do things, especially when we take, you know, we, we, we um, lay out a single transistor or something and then use it at a higher hierarchy and connect several of them and use that at a higher hierarchy. And all of a sudden we run into some sort of a density problem that we didn't know existed until we really got higher up in, in, the, in the level. So this is um, very tough. Okay. So. Um, really, it makes the, the floor planning of both, uh, you know, I mean, this is mainly for mixed signal design or, you know, custom design, but it really makes it tedious. And it, it also means that we may have to have these areas of transition, as you can see here, that are just wasted areas in order to not have density problems in between different areas of the design. So this is something that happens when we do lay out at these types of technologies. And you have to be aware of it, and it's very aggravating, and you should uh, go and uh, make as, uh, your layout as early as possible and your design as possible in order to run into these things and, and deal with them. Um, another thing is, and this I will discuss uh, in the next section, is that due to layout dependent effects, really the models, um, uh, if they do take these things into consideration, they will change the uh, operation of our transistors and so forth very uh, deeply depending on how the layout is. And so you really want to have this um, this uh, early layout during your design process so you can go back and fix things at the schematic level.
So that was a, a quick overview of FinFET layout, and now we'll move into the layout-dependent effects and the parasitics.